welcome to Community Voices with Carly Lissa Thorne. And I have a beautiful guest with me today, and I am with Janet Wagner, and we're going to be talking about children today, and she's a voice for children. So welcome, Janet. Thank you, Carly. Um, glad to be here. So I would love for you to share with the audience, what got you inspired to work with children? What was the beginnings for you? The beginning was when I brought my son home from Russia um, in 2005. I, um, I decided that I wanted to be a mom. Um, and I was working for investment bankers at the time. I had just finished my undergrad degree. And I was thinking, well, do I want to go for a PhD in philosophy or, well, maybe law school would be a better choice because uh, I could be a single mom and support myself and a family because I didn't have any prospects at the time. And so I started the process of, uh, well, I went to law school and then I started the process of um, adopting from Russia, which was the most favorable country for um, single women at the time. Um, and when he got home, I could not believe that you could possibly love one being as much as I love this child. And um, so I became very interested in, it, in adoption and in international adoption. And then all of the um, fascinating developmental um, things that children did. It was just amazing. Um, and after he got home, um, I had met somebody and we married. Uh, and a couple years later, went back. I knew I didn't want to raise an only child, so we went back and, and brought our daughter home um, from Russia, the very same baby home, worked with all the same people, and it was really wonderful to go back and see everyone. Um, and then um, uh, she was diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome. So as I became more involved in uh, learning about fetal alcohol syndrome and the diagnosis and the, um, the long-term um, prospects for, uh, for people with um, FAS and FASD, um, I became more and more disillusioned with my law practice and eventually left um, and went back to school for an advanced law degree in child and family law so that I could help other families like me and my family. So now I know you've developed an advocacy or a voice, if you will, for children. So right. what are you doing in your practice? So now let, let's go back and clarify a little bit. So you, you do still have a law practice that is specifically for children, is that correct? Yes. Yes, Okay. It is. So can you talk a little bit, and actually I'd love for you to actually tell the, the public what is the name of your practice and have you and the and the advocacy you've created for that and then go back into how do you change your practice from what you used to do and what is it that you're specifically doing now okay so my law practice now it's called the Children's Center for Law and Advocacy and my office is in Glen Ellen and I represent children and families throughout DuPage County in the areas of special education in um, school discipline matters, uh, truancy, juvenile justice, and then because I love it, adoptions, um, and along with that, guardianships. Um, and I decided to, to open this practice. Um, a woman who's on my board of directors, um, she and her family were moving to California. She had a special education practice um, that was a nonprofit. And um, as I was sitting in her class, she mentioned, you know, maybe some of you will go out and do this. And I started thinking, that would be something interesting. That's something I could do. Both of my children have IEPs. I understand that process. I know what it's like to be a parent. And then I was learning the law about it. Um, and so when it came time for my, um, to decide whether I would do a thesis paper or a project, I decided to open my firm as the capstone project for this um, degree that I went back to do. Um, so I represent 
children and families and in various areas the the client is going to be either the child or the family um, and uh, help them through some very difficult times um, I think education is key for children and education is kind of the, the driving practice area um, when children feel successful at learning they want to stay in school they want to do well in school they're not going to misbehave because they're frustrated, because they, they can't do the schoolwork, um, because they feel badly about themselves, because they can't keep up with their peers. You're, I, my view is that you'll have less um, school discipline matters. Um, it will um, prevent truancy from children who don't want to go back to school because they're not doing well and then um, along with that it will hopefully prevent juvenile justice matters um, because the children will be in school and not um, on the streets uh, getting in trouble and, and doing things um, so that's that's the whole reason behind the Children's Center for Law and Advocacy so I want to go back to two things because you and I are just talking and again of course everybody that's listening might not know a few few words that I actually do know because um, I actually have a, a deep background in working with the disabled population. So two things, you mentioned um, the city where you are, not everyone may, may not know where you, what state you're in. So you're from where? Um, I'm in Glen Ellen, Illinois. It's a western suburb of Chicago. <laughs> Okay, so I want to clarify that. That was the first thing that I cued into. And we're just rattling off things, and people are going, "Huh? Where? What?" Yeah. And the other thing is, you mentioned um, IP, IEP, and I know that is a uh, process people go through. That when we're going through programs, when working with disabled children, and when you're going through IEP programs, when you're putting together programs for children that are disabled. So, can you actually elaborate a little bit more as to what is an IEP? Certainly. Uh, an IEP is an individualized education program um, and children with um, various disabilities, learning disabilities, um, certain health disorders, uh, there's a, there are various categories under, um, under federal law for children to qualify for an IEP. Um, and when they do qualify, they'll get extra assistance uh, in school to help them succeed at learning. Um, so for instance my daughter lives with fetal alcohol syndrome um, and she typical of um, people with FAS her math skills are weak. Um, you have to go through an evaluation process not all children will qualify for an IEP. The disability has to affect their ability to learn um, and so for her, um, she has an IEP, she qualifies, and she gets extra support in math as well as certain uh, behavioral supports um, for when she's frustrated, she might not react in a way that, um, that would be typical for, for all children. Um, persons, children with disabilities who do not qualify for an IEP but nevertheless need help at school uh, may qualify for what's called a 504 plan in, and that's under the um, Rehabilitation Act, it's a federal law. Uh, and a 504 plan will um, uh, require certain accommodations for that child so that they can learn successfully. It might be extra time taking tests, it might be a quiet area taking tests, um, they might need, um, it might be a physical mobility issue that requires certain accommodations and supports for a child. Um, so there's a variety of um, educational supports depending upon the child um, that they may qualify for. Another big one also in, is also in taking tests where some children need to actually hear the tests in their ears. In other words, some kids don't do really well just reading tests. So I know that is another big one when we were doing the IEPs with some of our children where they actually got to also hear the, the written, you know, the actual written words. They got to hear it, not yeah. just written. So I love yeah. the IEP programs and like you said, all the different variations. Yes. So, and that's why I'm, I'm asking you these questions because we just rattle the stuff off because we work with disabled children 
And um, my field is working with autistic children and all different facets, you know, uh, from autism spectrum to, like you said, you know, uh, just all the different spectrums. But and all the different, like you said, the quiet spaces to sometimes being just in in a room just with themselves to having someone actually read them this read them the actual questions to auditory to you know where they're actually just being asked the questions and then reciting the answers to so all these different things that we don't we take for granted. A lot of people, as we're talking to the public in general, don't understand all the different facets of all these categories of what we do for children that are disabled and all the different programs that are out there for people that do need support. So we just we just rattle it all off, and we're just sitting there going, da 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 So I really wanted to really bring up some of those things, because there, there is a plethora of resources and support for children that do have disabilities of all kinds. Right. Um, so I think it's really important that you know you bring that up and and do you know explain what I you know the different programs out there the IEP and as you said um, the I forget the numbers five oh five forty right five oh four five oh four exactly I'm right sorry. and with an IEP um, the key is that it's individualized and it's what that child needs. Um, so there's not a set program for any given disability, um, and you're and you're exactly right. Um, my other um, child, my son, um, he needs help with uh, with writing things. Um, he's got a million great ideas, um, and he just can't put pen to paper. So he has an aide that scribes, and this is the sort of thing that parents, when they have a child with a disability, the, as you said, the plethora of resources and the wide variety of supports that are available are confusing to parents. And if you if you're not, um, if you don't work in this area all the time, you don't know what all the options are, and you don't know that that you can suggest things and you can tell the school all these things. And parents need that. They really need that kind of support in order to get the proper and appropriate support for their child to learn successfully. I think a lot of it is that we as parents need to stop looking as, um, I think a lot of it, at least for me, I grew up with a ton of medical problems and I still don't see 2020. I think we need to stop, uh, how can I put this, feeling embarrassed that we don't have perfect children or yeah. that you know, this isn't perfect or this isn't perfect and actually start being advocate for, like you, you're an advocate for children. We need to start being advocate for our children. It got to the point where me as a person, I learned to be my own advocate because I knew no one else was going to be one for me. So I became, I studied everything there was possibly, you know, from, and, and that's why I became advocate for, that's why, by the way, I got into the population of disabled population. I work with Down's children, autistic children, and from a very young age, from the time I graduated high school, while I was in high school, I started studying the, mental popu the, the mentally disabled population because I had so many medical problems growing up. I wanted to know everything that was wrong with my body. I studied Western philosophy, Eastern philosophies, everything I could get my hands on, studied theology, philosophy, you know, anything, psychology, so that I could really understand not just me, but help others. And I started yeah. becoming my own self-advocate and started to learn that I had to get out of my own ego and my own self and get every possible help that I could so that I could go to grow myself and also help others. And so I think as parents, we need to get out of our own box and our own ego and our own worry and go look at all the resources out there to possibly help anything we can to further our children, not to push our children to be perfect, however, to get the resources to help them any way we can, yes. whether it be, like you said, and, and not to take advantage. Now, here's the thing that people also push, I think, in society. We are taking advantage of the government. We're taking advantage of the system. Put that aside. I'm talking about finding what resources there are to help. I'm talking about help our children. There's a difference between taking advantage of the system and helping our children. What resources are there to help our children, right? Yes. I mean, there's a big difference. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. Um, I know that a lot of times parents are afraid of 
uh, labeling their child. But it's when you when you're able to accept that label that you then are able to tap into all the resources. Um, personally, I you know for instance, this is why I don't mind talking about um, my children's diagnoses. One. I do want it to be the correct one. Um, our, our school wanted to say that my child, my son, was either ADD or ADHD, and that was wrong because that didn't get to the core problem. And until you do that, you're not going to get the appropriate resources. He would learn if only he could pay attention. That was the wrong way to look at it, really. He's not paying attention because it's so frustrating and overwhelming to learn the way you're teaching him. Um, and so, you know, part of what I do here also, uh, aside from representing children and families as a lawyer, is to provide parent support and training to, to help parents understand that. And in my view, this is this is what it is. Your child is perfect the way they are, but in order for them to go out and succeed and be productive, and and I don't want to say successful because that's really very um, very personal, but to be a productive and contributing member of our communities as they are now, they need these supports. They need different things from other children and the the law and policy makers recognize this and I think that that I think that that's critical for parents to understand is that these are things that you deserve that your child deserves so that they can be the best they can be out in the world they're perfect the way they are but they need to go out into the world and do things and be able to communicate and and work in this world, um, and it. I know that for me, it was very difficult to find um, resources for myself to help me get to a place where I could help my children. Um, and I am extraordinarily fortunate to ha be in the position that I'm in, where. I already had a law degree and years of, of experience in law where I knew all kinds of people and where I had gotten to a point where I'm kind of not afraid to ask anybody anything and <laughs> to go and research anything and ask questions um, because it all helped my children. Um, it helped me accept them the way they are. Um, and um, and now I can go out and do that for other people through my firm. And that's the key is is we have to again when you go into a relationship or you marry someone, it, you know it's like accepting them for who they are. You don't go into saying, okay, I like this person, but what if they tweak this and they tweak that? Then I'll love them. It's like when, like you said, when you brought your child home, it's like you love you're like you could not believe that you had this much love for this child, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like you didn't automatically then say, well, if my child had this kind of nose and if my child had this many fingers, then I would love them, right? It was kind of like you loved the child completely and wholly as that child was. And as they grew and then all of a sudden then you found out the child had this, you'd all of a sudden go, I don't want the child, and I'll throw it in the garbage can. It's like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, no. You loved the child completely and wholly as it was the minute you had it in its arms, you know, the minute you, you held it, right? I, yeah. I think we we have these, I mean, I'm not saying there aren't those, there are those people that unfortunately are that way, and we, we hope that people aren't that way, but unfortunately society is the way it is. But the, the point is, you know, we have to learn to love people the way they are, completely and wholly as they are. And, and the fact that we as beings, my God, there's there's the wonderful tool called what the internet. I mean, there's so many resources out there. There's Google. There's I mean, and again, there's people like you that are out there. There are a like I said, a plethora of resources, and there are. We just have to open our eyes and our ears. I like I I like to use an analogy of our eyes, our all-seeing eyes. There's so much out there. We just have to be open to seeing what's out there, yes. and using the tools and resources that are out there. Yes. 
Yes, you are exactly. And, yeah. and thankfully, there are people like you that are out, out there. Um, and by the way, since there is this is a podcast, please let everyone know, again, your name, where you are located, and what is your website. Certainly. Uh, I'm Janet Wagner. I'm the Managing Attorney and Executive Director of the Children's Center for Law and Advocacy. I practice in, um, in DuPage County, Illinois. It's uh, the county west of uh, Chicago and Cook County. Um, my office is in Glen Ellen, Illinois, and um, my website is www.childrencenterforlaw.com. Thanks. Kelly. Thank you for that. Um, and, and I'm I'm really thrilled there are people out there like you because the more the more of people like you out there, the more we can have you know the tools and resources for people that do have disabilities and issues and it, and it's not just even disability disabilities I mean there's even people of lesser disabilities that need resources and tools and you know what I'm saying I think there should be centers like this everywhere for everybody um, and I just wish that more people would open their eyes and get and be willing to open their mouths and seek the help that they need in, in, in all avenues of life. You know what I mean? Yes. I, I love it. I love it. I would love to have my, my firm go nationwide <laughs> and for families everywhere to have these kinds of resources. I love um, I just uh, finished today building the uh, the website, and um, and I hope to be able to keep up and and get information on the website, uh, so to connect people with resources. Um, you know, as I talk to people, as I come across things, um, and um, and and learn things, um, I just hope to be able to share it, and that. Um, the number of people here in my community, I've, there are some wonderful, wonderful friends, fellow moms, um, who have who have helped me. Um, this is, certainly is not a one-woman show. Um, people with all kinds of skills and abilities, and um, who, the, you know, the outpouring of support for this venture has been really, um, really touching. Um, so. It's not just me who's getting the word out. I'm the face, I'm the spokesperson, but all these other people help me and they have all kinds of skills and they bring me all kinds of information so that I can then spread it out and share it with other people and just keep it going. It's all about paying it forward. You know, um, it really is. I call that the tribe and I am all about paying it forward. I actually have a website called um, the, uh, paying it for the ripple effect dot com. So it's yeah. It's uh, to me everything in life is by the way the ripple effect because as right. as one person does one thing, one person does another is the ripple effect. And to me, all of life is about paying it forward. Um, what are some valuable? I, I like we have. I'd say about seven more minutes. I would love to end the show with giving people some valuable tips on what they should. Do and in other words, and I don't necessarily like the word "should" because that kind of connotates that they haven't done. But what are some tips that we can live, leave the audience with on things they should look for, or just things they should they can do in their life to begin to, in other words, you know, like just just to begin to take steps in the direction. Of opening their eyes and starting and on a path of advocating for themselves and their children. Oh, wow! Um, I love that question. Um, what can they do? One is um, trust their instincts. Trust yourself. Trust your instincts. Um, you know your child best. You know your child better than anyone, and Trust your instincts if something feels a little bit off. Um, and don't, um, you know, when, when, um, when Sasha was having such difficulties when she was little and uh, could not figure out what, what was wrong with this child, why is she acting like this, um, 
nobody said fetal alcohol syndrome and our pediatrician didn't. Um, nobody she came in contact with, nobody in, in early intervention. And you know, uh, her, both of her, 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 the extended family, oh, this is what two-year-olds do, they have tantrums, and I'm thinking, not like this. Um, so trust your instincts that something is a little bit off. It doesn't mean your child is bad, it doesn't mean your child is defective, it means that you need to find some help and figure it out so that you can parent your child effectively, so that you can help your child become the best person they can be. Um, trust your instincts and believe in yourself. Um, you know, once you, once you find that you're going to be starting down this path, um, you need to be strong and you need to, um, you need to speak up, you need to think about it, don't accept, um, don't accept what others say. Consider, but don't necessarily accept it as gospel truth. Um, believe in yourself. I think that is just the key to all of it. And what would be the, once, once they've actually trusted their gut and they know yeah. something's not necessarily right, they just, something's off, then what would be the next step? Then, um, if your child is under the age of three, uh, every state has early intervention services. Contact them. Um, uh, always get try to get more evaluations rather than fewer. Um, talk to people. Talk to other parents. Um, do some research on the internet. Um, if your child is in school already, ask for a full evaluation, a multidisciplinary evaluation. The school is required to do it. Um, a lot of times. Um, uh, parents don't know to even ask. They don't know that this is even available to them. Um, talk to the teachers. Uh, talk to people. Talk to people who know your child. Um, but if you suspect that your child needs additional help in school, the multidisciplinary evaluation is the first step um, towards an IEP or even a 504 plan. Um, and, uh, and don't be deterred. Um, by anybody who says, oh, you know, he doesn't really need it, or we're trying, uh, you know, here's another one, is response to intervention. Um, that takes too long. Um, ask for it. The school has to do it uh, within a certain number of days of the, um, the parent's request. And don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid that your child might be labeled, because it's all in the name of getting them additional help. Now, that's another thing I like to address. So how do you address the labeling? Because, you know, here's the thing, you know, there is some stigma with labeling. How do you then address as a child gets older to destigmatize the labeling? Because, you know, you don't want your child being teased and stuff like that. So how do you address dealing with the psychology of the stigma of the labeling? Because that's a big one. I think a lot of people struggle with that. I mean, I, I, think, I think there's definitely... You know, you definitely want to get the child to help. Absolutely. There's, there's no, there's absolutely no not doing that. Okay. However, you definitely don't want your child being attached because I don't agree with a child being attached to a label because you definitely want a child to grow, and you yeah. don't want a child because there, there does, there does become a psychological issue where a child becomes then becomes attached to a label and in some cases starts to use the label as an excuse not to grow. So at some point we need to address how to destigmatize the label and let them understand that yes, it is a, it is a diagnosis or a label. However, that is not who they are. That is a great question. Um, that is something that I have thought about for for both of my children a lot. Um, I'm not sure of what the answer is um, across the board. Um, I, I can share that when my, when my son was in kindergarten was having difficulty keeping up, his writing was so slow. Um, we used some mantras, my speed is a good speed. Um, and so I think that um, you know, helping your child understand that they are just fine the way they are, um, but that they might need a little bit extra help on some things. Um, 
the the label um, I can definitely see children uh, relying on that. Um, I don't know what the answer is for how to motivate them uh, to move beyond their label if they're starting to rely on that. Um, there is a book that I started reading called Nurture Shock by Poe Bronson and Ashley Mer Merivale, I think it is, um, on the um, uh, on motivating children um, and you know letting them know that that yeah you're working really hard at this and I see that and validating their hard work um, that may help. Um, I don't know that I have a good answer across the board. I think it's so individualized uh, by the child, um, trying to figure out what is what's that little piece that motivates them, that gets them beyond it to to help them uh, see that they are just great. Well, I'm going to ask you to send me that in an email, so I'm going to include that in the blog. What well, has been absolutely amazing having you? Thank you so much for joining me, Janet. So um, it is it is the end of our today. Um, however, I know I'll be talking to you in the future. I will be putting together an entire blog post. We'll have all of Janet's information and uh, links to her website and everything you need to know about her and where you can find her. And I will include the name of that book. So um, you have been with your host, um, Carlissa Thorne. This has been the show Community Voices, which is all about reaching out to community and giving voices to those who would like to know more information about all sorts of information. And it's been a delight having you, Janet. And thank you so much for advocating for children. It's such an amazing thing that you do. Thank you so much for being with me. Harley, thank you so much for inviting me to come and speak with you. I really enjoyed it. And I greatly appreciate the opportunity to talk about my firm and what I do for children. Please thank tell me, uh, please share with everyone the name of the company again and the website. Absolutely. Children's Center for Law and Advocacy. And the website is www.childrencenterforlaw.com. Thank you so much. And you've been with your host, Carlissa Thorne, and you can find me at carlissathorne.com. As I said, I will be putting together a wonderful website that has everything embedded in it, including an embedded podcast and a video as well. So for tonight, it is good night. I wish everyone a wonderful evening, and I look forward to being with you next week. Have a great night, everybody.